So one of the questions was actually all of the races from an from a stat wise perspective. Now that was a bit of an odd question. It isn't really a lore question, but I've asked it by several people, so I've decided to go ahead and give it a pass and give an answer to this question. So I'm going to be doing this with my notes because I don't have all this stuff written down. It is worth noting all of this is still malleable. I am still technically making changes to the rule set of Primus uh, here and there. The Magasean rule set is actually what I call it. Uh, this is a rule set I spent years, literally years, working on. I'm actually quite uh, pleased with it overall. It has been working very well so far, but it's not flawless, which is why it's still technically an ongoing beta. Um, so we'll be discussing a few of the basic spells, a few of the basic uh, classes that have been added, a few of the changes to the overall rules. This is a system effectively built off of the 3.5 system, which was which it also takes some uh, ideas and acknowledgement from 4th edition, 5th edition, Pathfinder, and a couple other things. But let's talk about races first, which I gotta find here. There we go. Now, it is worth noting, the races I'm about to list are the only races that I've actually bothered to make stats for. Arguments can and have been made to play races other than these, and there are races other than these. But that's kind of a going into the future sort of a situation. So let's start with the elves. Now, I've talked about the elves before. Um, elves in my setting are pretty middle-of-the-road normal kind of people. So they gain one bonus feat at the start, four bonus skill points at the start, and three bonus skill points per level. That probably sounds familiar to anybody who's played D&D. They automatically know both Elven and Common. They are a medium-based creature, a base move speed of 30 feet, and have an average lifespan of 80 years. Again, all of this probably sounds very, very uh, normal. Um, that's the idea. The Elves are considered the normal uh, race, the, the morphic race. It's also worth noting, some people are like, well, clearly the elves have dominated this, this planet. Uh, no. <laughs> Just to make that clear, you certainly hear, certainly hear a lot about the elves, but they are by no means the dominant race. In fact, there is no dominant race uh, in terms of percentage or, or otherwise influence. You hear about the elves most simply by circumstance. In all honesty, the dwarves probably have more influence in Alluvia, which is where the elves are based, than the elves do, but I digress. Lord Elves. Lord Elves gain a bonus to their intellect, uh, bonus to their lo they gain low light vision automatically, and they have a bonus to their will save, which increases every level. They automatically gain an Elven in common. Uh, me uh, they are medium creatures. Their base move speed is thirty, and their average lifespan is about two centuries. Lord Elves also are a little bit different. Uh, their skin looks like it is literally made of various plate stone, like alabaster or slate or obsidian and they tend to be a little bit different from the other types of elves. Uh, there's also some cultural, biological stuff, but that wasn't the question. This is all about gameplay and stat stuff, so I'm leaving all that at the door. Uh, dwarves. The dwarves are pretty normal. They gain a bonus to their constitution, a negative to their dexterity. They uh, gain dark vision. They have, a, uh, they have a few bonuses based on their size, which basically gives them to a bonus against being uh, charged or tripped. They gain a bonus against poisons, as usual. They gain a bonus to their appraise skill, which is useful. And they automatically gain dwarven in common. They are medium-based creatures, their base move paid is 20 feet, and their average lifespan is about 100. Gnomes. Gnomes have several negatives, but several pluses. Negative to strength, negative to dexterity. Bonus to wisdom, charisma, and int. They gain a bonus to weaving, awareness, and that's it, actually. Uh, they also automatically gain uh, additional crafting XP, CXP, as part of their nature. They automatically gain common and one language of their choice. They are medium creatures with base move speed of 30 and an average lifespan of 70. Half-elves. Half-elves are very different. Because a half-elf is a half-elf and a half-blank. So basically, you gain uh, two skill bonus skills at the start, one bonus skill at the le to every level. That's the elven side of thing. All the other bon benefits depend on what the other race is, so that's variable. And it's basically about half of the bon benefits another race gets, racially speaking. Um, they automatically gain common and one of the languages from the bonus language of the other half to start. They are medium creatures, their base main speed is 30, their average lifespan is 50 years. Fairies. Fairies have a bonus to their constitution, wisdom, and their knowledge elements. They automatically gain the elemental vision, which I've talked about before. Uh, they may use their wings to uh, hover, maneuver, and occasionally fly, depending on their actual level. That's, that, there's no stats for that, it's just me determining it. Uh, they automatically know how to speak fey and common. They are medium creatures, base move speed of 30. Their average lifespan is unknown. As I've mentioned before, no fairy has died of old age, so... 
Uh, trolls. Trolls gain a bonus to constitution and dexterity. They may uh, they have a bonus ability where they can regenerate major injuries, uh, which is something that's like a long-term detriment to your, to your character stats that you gain from being hit sufficiently hard, or otherwise being damaged in a large way. So they can actually regenerate major injuries without any external periods if they get a long rest in, which is basically eight hours of sleep. Um, that's actually been used in the campaign by Ashakel, I believe. Uh, they automatically know Orcish and Common. They are a medium creature with a base move speed of 35, an average lifespan of 140. Uh, hang on, I need to make a quick edit here. Uh, Banderlings. Banderlings have an increase to their dexterity, a negative to their int, a bonus to their acrobatics and athletics, and they gain an automatic bonus to any haggling rolls. That's just a... There's no stat bonus, they just gain a bonus to their haggling rolls. Uh, they gain a dodge bonus uh, of their, to their AC equal to one half of their level rounded up. They automatically gain Orcish in common. They are a medium creature with base move speed of... Uh, that's way too high. That should be 40 feet. And with an average lifespan of 80. Ogres! Ogres have a huge boost to strength and a pretty big negative to their uh, charisma and... And that shouldn't be so. So there's charisma. Uh, they gain automatically no common, no other creatures. They are a large creature with the benefits that came for that, and they have a base move speed of 30 and an average lifespan of 180. Orcs, or orcs, I can't even say it like Jana says it. Um, they gain a plus one to strength, and two bonus feats when characters created. They also gain one bonus skill point per level. They automatically low Orcish, Common, and one additional uh, language at the start. They are medium creatures, move speed of 30, average lifespan of 80. The Burun. Burun get a bonus to Wisdom and a big bonus to Charisma and gain skill points at the start. They have Dark Vision and automatically know Serpent and Common. They are a medium creature with a base move speed of 15. Uh, their average lifespan is about 200. Moorsmen. The Moorsmen gain a bonus to Wisdom and Constitution, a negative to Charisma, and a big bonus to all three of their saving throws. They automatically know Serpent and Common. They are a medium creature, and their base move speed is 40, with an average lifespan of 90 years. The Sklavi. The Sklavi gain an automatic plus one to every one of their attributes, Strength, Constitution, Dex, Int, Wisdom, and Charisma. So it's plus one across the board, and they get an additional plus four that can be distributed however they want at character creation. They automatically know Serpent and Common. They are a medium creature with a base move speed of 35 and an average lifespan of 100 years. The Lugians. The Lugians gain uh, a big bonus to Strength, Constitution, and Knowledge Engineering. They automatically know Lugian and Common. They are a large creature, although I've actually been thinking about that, and I think they might actually qualify as larger than large. I'll have to look into that. But if you're playing a Lugian, I've actually ruled, and I did this with Guido as well. Guido is basically a midget amongst Lugians. He is very small. So if you're playing a Lugian, you are playing a very small Lugian. So you, you would probably be a large character regardless. Most Lugians are bigger than that. Um... His base move speed, uh, base move speed of Lugian is 30, uh, and an average lifespan is 170. Lycanthropes. Uh, lycanthropes gain a bonus to Wisdom and Awareness. Uh, they have one bonus hit die per level that's rolled, so not automatic. They gain low light vision. Um, they gain some bonuses uh, to their AC. That's actually not valid anymore. That rule has been removed. I'll have to edit that. So ignore that point. They automatically gain advantage on all social roles. So anything involving diplomacy, deception, that kind of a thing. Uh, they automatically gain common and one other language of their choice. They are a medium creature with a base move speed of 40 feet. Their average lifespan is unknown, because no lycanthrope has died of old age. Drudges. Drudges gain a negative to constitution, a negative to strength, and 10 bonus skill points at character creation with an additional 3 bonus skill points per level. A drudge can treat every skill other than weaving as a class skill regardless of class. They gain a bonus to any mercantile transaction at the GM's discretion. They are automatically no common and under common. They are a small creature with a base move speed of 25 and an average lifespan of 60 years. Ulthoi. Quick aside, there are three. There are many different types of Ulthoi that are effectively different creatures when it comes to stats. 
um, each one being belonging to a different brood. I have house ruled that you, there are three broods you may have be a part of if you're making a character. Uh, gardener, worker, and soldier. Uh, if you'll remember, Kesrenthka, the only player character Olthoi ever, was actually a worker. Uh, so these stats actually kind of vary a little bit based on that, but this specific stat I'm about to give you is for the worker, which is the most common one and the one I would you know, try and force you to be unless you gave a good argument otherwise. You gain a plus to your constitution, strength, and diplomacy. You may make unarmed attacks without any penalty uh, reg uh, as if you were at the monk's progression regardless of class. So they can be pretty good at unarmed thanks to their, uh, their second set of arms, which are basically pinchers there. They automatically know skittish, common, and one bonus language of their choice. They are large creatures with a base movement speed of 60. They, uh... They have a couple of other bonuses that re involve uh, SR and DR, but those kind of vary based on the brood, so I'm not going to give you specific stats there. And their average lifespan is unknown. No Otho has ever died of, of natural causes. Moss warts. Now, these guys have not seen as much uh, on-screen uh, presence as I would like. Uh, moss warts gain a big bonus to wisdom and intellect, and a bonus to their awareness. They gain weaving as a class skill regardless of their class. Uh, they gain a negative one to reputation with anyone else that is part of the civilized folk. If you don't know what that means, basically if a moss wart was to walk up to a person on the street and say hi, uh, that would actually involve a diplomacy role for them to not be disgusted by the moss wart because of that negative reputation. That also puts them at disadvantage on virtually every social role. Um, moss warts are 100% immune to natural and magical poisons and diseases. They automatically gain under common and common. They are medium creatures with a base move speed of 30 and average lifespan of 130. Kobolds. Kobolds have a big negative to their strength, a big bonus to their dex, and a bonus to their stealth. They gain dark vision. Um, they have a situational bonus which basically means the more pe uh, member of their pack that is present, the greater bonus they have to both attack and damage. Now, pack does not have to be other kobolds. If there's a kobold and three party members, they gain, a pl they, they gain the bonus for the three party members because that's part of their pack. If they are actually considered part of that pack. It is a role-playing thing in addition to a stat thing. Kobolds automatically know undercommon and common. They are small creatures with a base move speed of 30 feet and an average lifespan of 60 years. Goblins. Goblins gave a big bonus to their charisma, to their intellect, and to their deception. They may roll... Uh... Ah, right. Whenever they are doing a mercantile transaction of any kind, they roll a d20. Now, the way this works is that d20 slants how that works. Like, first you do the Hagrin rolls, and then the goblin rolls just the d20. Based on what that number is, it will slant the, the end, end transaction towards this direction. For example, if it goes to 1, well, then the transaction goes very badly. But if it goes to 20, it goes very, very well in the goblin's favor. Anything above 10 is in the goblin's favor. Anything below is against. Um... So that's, that's, that's the kind of thing they can do and do regularly. Uh, they automatically gain under common, common, and one bonus language of their choice. They are a medium creature with a base move speed of 30 and an average lifespan of 80 years. Knolls. I had to nerf Knolls recently. Uh, so I'm not actually sure if this is the... I think this is the nerfed Knolls I'm about to read to you. They gain a bonus to their strength and dexterity, a pretty big negative to their wisdom. Uh, they gain a bonus to athletics and survival. Knolls gain an automatic plus two damage per level, regardless of all circumstances. So yeah, I think that's the nerfed thing, because they were actually stronger than that before. They automatically know under common. You'll notice I didn't mention common in that. They are a medium creature with a base move speed of 35, and an average lifespan of 60 years. Centaurs gain a bonus to dex and, de and strength, uh, a plus bonus to their healing and their survival skills. They gain the centaur trample feat to start which is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, they gain dark vision, and their melee reach is increased to 10 foot instead of 5. However, they are at a negative 2 reputation. Remember how I mentioned the moss warts earlier would have to roll just to say hi? A centaur has to roll not to be attacked on sight. There's cultural and social reasons for that, don't mistake. Uh, they automatically know under common. They are a medium creature with a base move speed of 60, putting them on par with the Olthoi. 
and an average lifespan of 50 years. Finally, the mites. A mite has plus four to int. They may choose any three languages to start, uh, uh, just, just at, at the default. They automatically gain common in addition to that. They are a small creature with a base move speed of 30 and an average lifespan of 90 years. So that's all our playable races uh, that I have stats for so far. Again, there are other races, and again, there may be stats for those other races. Um, the next thing that was being asked here, let me look at this really quick, uh, was the classes. So I'm going to go ahead and scroll down to classes here really quick. Now, most of the other classes function normally. It's only the magically inclined classes that have varied. So let's talk about black mages. Black mages can use black magic. I know, a shocker, right? Uh, black magic being the easiest type of magic to learn, black mages by consequence tend to be the most common. But the weird thing is black magic is another one of those easy to learn, hard to master. So you'll see a lot of level 1 and 2 black mages in Primus, but very, very few black mages of higher level. Um, black mages gain a fairly large amount of meta magic and uh, a decent, uh, a decent amount of, of, of spells to work with. Um... The innate, the innate bonus of a black mage is they get more mana. They have a larger mana pool than other mages uh, that can be used to affect if you manage to multi-class that. Uh, I suppose this is a good time to say, I'm going to actually pause with the classes. I have my own metamagic feats and my own metamagic system for determining mana cost. It also revolves around something called maximize. Uh, there's actually a chart to determine how much maximized mana costs. I'm not going to go into the details of that right there. It's a chart. It's, it's mathed out. Point being, every spell has a maximized cost that's automatically attached to it. You don't, now, you're maybe like, well, what, you have to cast maximized mana to cast it? No. What I mean is any, you know, if you're going to cast a level 8 medium spell, the maximized cost for that will always be the same, regardless of the spell, regardless of circumstance. It's always going to be the maximized cost of like 3 or whatever it is. I don't know the actual number off the top of my head. So that maximize cost determines the the mana uh, the additional mana that it costs in order to do meta magic. That's how you determine the cost of, of casting meta magic. These include energy substitution, where you may cast uh, you may pay a maximize one maximize cost in order to replace damage type with another damage type. Uh, extend, which is a two maximize cost to double the duration. Heighten, which you pay one maximize cost to increase the effect of spell level. Uh, intensify. You, you pay two maximized costs to double the result of the dice. You cannot actually do this with maximizing. You cannot maximize and intensify. Well, what do you mean by maximize and intensify? The maximized cost also applies to maximizing. Maximizing is something every mage can do. It's, it's basically an innate feat, for all intents and purposes, an innate metamagic feat. And maximized removes, removes the dice roll. If you would normally d 3d6, well, that's just 3 three sixes combined together. So you just plain do 18 healing or 18 damage. It's just universal. So you cannot maximize and intensify. You can't do 3d6 times 2. Or excuse me, you can't do 18 times 2. You can do 3d6 times 2. And I'm probably explaining this wrong, so whatever. Um, persistent spell, which costs 5 maximize cost to increase the duration of a given spell to 24 hours. There's some a uh, little errata about that. Uh, quicken spell. You have to pay four maximized cost to be able to cast a second spell in the same turn. The four maximized cost is spent on the second spell in the given round. It also does not provoke an attack of opportunity. Stealth spell, which costs three maximized cost, and it basically does exactly what it sounds. It completely removes, it makes it so you can do a, spell th a stealth roll on the spell to prevent people from noticing that you cast it, which can be useful in some circumstances. Uh, there's silent and still, which have never been used, and I may actually remove from the game, in all honesty. And finally, subdual, which is really important and has been used many times many times, where you pay maximized cost, one maximized cost, in order to make the spell damage be subdual damage. Very simple. In other words, non-lethal damage. So now that we got all that out of the way, uh, black mages. So then we go up to white mages. Uh, again, we're really focusing on the stats, not the lore. So white mages can cast white magic. Uh, actually, let's rewind a bit. Why don't we discuss the black magic spells? Because I got those right here, too. You're getting all sorts of stat stuff. What do you want from me? So... Spells are divided into basic, medium, heavy, and ultimate. Uh, these determine a lot of factors. Uh, they determine the relative mana cost of the spells. 
they determine uh, the maximized cost of the spells, and they determine which spells you learn. For example, a black mage uh, will learn... Here, I'll scroll down to these specific numbers here. At level 1, a black mage knows all basic spells. At level 4, they gain two medium spells of their choice. At level 8, they gain two heavy spells of their choice, etc., etc., etc. So that's how you determine the type of spell. It, it's supposed to be a generalized indic indicative, indicative uh, to help categorize them. So, basic spells. Uh, fire, Blizzard, Bolt, and Quake, which do fire, water, air, and earth type damage. You may notice the other four elements are not represented there. Uh, that's where energy substitution comes in, if you want to do life type damage, for example. Uh, all of those do the same type of damage, uh, excuse me, the same amount of damage, which is 1d6 times spell level. Uh, so the only real difference there is the type of damage that is done, which can vary and can have significance. Now, as an aside, you might be like, what do you mean per spell level? Well, spell level is determined by how you cast it. This is a new system of, of my own divination here. Um, although I'm sure other systems have done this. Let's say you're a level 4 black mage. That means you can cast up to a spell level of 4. It's actually really simple. You can cast fire 1, fire 2, fire 3, or fire 4. If you're level 20, you can cast fire 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, or 20. Make sense? So, spell level you determine. You don't always have to cast at your max. You can choose at level 18 if you're fighting some little guy to cast a lower level spell, either to uh, save yourself mana, or if you're interested in not killing someone, or if you're just trying to get someone's attention, or, or if you're trying to be sneaky. The higher level a spell, the more difficult it is to stealth it, okay? And there's, a, and there's other tactical uh, choices there as well, but I, I think you get the idea. So, those are the basics uh, for black. Uh, black medium spells include Bio, Petrify, Drain, and Doom. Bio does uh, magic, uh, basic magic type damage, and when it does it, they must succeed at a fortitude roll to basically not be poisoned for a number of rounds equal to the spell level. Um, Petrify uh, actually does no damage, but once if it hits them, they have to succeed at a fortitude roll in order to avoid being petrified. While being petrified, they gain some bonuses to their a uh, SR and DR. However, uh, if they take a significant hit, which I determine what that is, they will shatter and die instantly. Um, drain, which does an amount of damage and then heals you for half of that damage. Doom. Now, the target has to succeed at a pretty easy will save, but if they don't succeed at this will save, they will be doomed for... they will gain the status effect of Doom for a number of rounds. There are ways to remove the status effect of Doom. If they do not remove the status effect of Doom, when Doom runs out, they go to downed status, just like that. That does not mean dead, by the way. There is a difference between downed and dead, and it should be obvious. I shouldn't have to explain that. So those are the medium spells. Then we go to heavy spells. Now, the heavy spells are basically upgrades of the basics. There's Freeze, Break, Tornado, and Flare, which does water, uh, earth, air, and fire type damage, respectively. But there's a secondary effect to each of them. Freeze uh, has a chance to affect them with the Stop condition. Break has a chance to affect them with the Petrify condition. Tornado has a chance to affect them with Confused condition. And Flare has a chance to give them a Dot which is damage over time. In other words, they will continue taking fire damage. There are two black ultimate spells. It is worth noting ultimate spells are designed to be kind of different. You don't learn an ultimate innately. You gain the ability to learn an ultimate, but in order to actually learn it, you have to go out and, and basically do a quest. You have, you have to earn it in lore. You don't just automatically learn how to cast these spells. Um, only a black mage can learn black ultimates. Only a white mage can learn white ultimates, only a yellow mage can learn yellow ultimates. So any of the hybrid classes cannot learn ultimate spells. Uh, which is the relevance there. And I just noticed my uh, my freaking... Sorry about the thing. There we go. Okay. The sun is my enemy. Um, the black ultimates are Murton. Murton does a huge amount of elemental type damage chosen by the caster, so it can be any of the eight elements. It automatically hits everything within a 500 foot radius radius of the target, including objects, friends, and foes, with the sole exception of the caster themselves. And then there's the spell Ultima, which does a large amount of 
typeless damage. Typeless damage is a unique thing in my setting. There's very, very, very few things that do typeless. Typeless basically pierces SR, DR, and virtually everything else. It's damage you're just going to get hit by, in other words. Um, it doesn't have any bonuses. Like, there's no such thing as something being weak to typeless, but it will always penetrate. Um, Ultima can be multi-targeted without penalty, uh, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Ultima can distinguish between friendly and enemy targets. Now, let me talk about that uh, multi-targeting thing. If I cast Fire 1, which does a d6 of damage, of fire damage, to one guy, that one guy takes a d6 of fire damage. If, however, let me look at my multi-targeting. Here we go. If I target Fire 1 on uh, two people, then the damage is reduced by three-fourths of whatever the d6 is, okay? Uh, rounded down, specifically. If I target up to five people, that's reduced to half the damage, and if I target over 10, it's reduced down to fourth. If I go over 15, it usually does nothing. It literally just has the visual effect and no damage is actually done. There are exceptions to that. So the significance of Ultima is I could target 100 people, and it would do the massive amount of damage to each of them without any multi-targeting penalties. Make sense? Uh, this also applies to healing, by the way. You can cure more than one person, and it'll be reduced for doing so. Uh, okay, so scroll down, scroll down. Um, so yeah, that's that. Let's talk about white mages. Uh, I already mentioned white mages in brief. Uh, white mages have... Uh, obviously, they learn white magic uh, and all the bonuses thereof. Uh, they... Uh, White mages gain an innate ability. Remember how black mages gained more of a mana pool as their innate ability? What a white mage ga gains is they can add an amount to the result of any spell that involves a dice roll at standard maximized cost. To explain what I mean by this, let's say they, they cast Cure 1. We'll make it very simple. So Cure 1 is a d6 of healing to you. So, and it's just one target, so we're making this really simple. I'm healing you for a d6. Okay? Now... As a white mage, I can add my wisdom modifier times uh, my spell type, okay, to that roll. Now, what I mean by spell type is it's based on the type of spell. For example, there's basic, he medium, heavy, and ultimate, right? So cure is a basic, which is one. So in other words, my wisdom modifier times one, which is just my wisdom modifier. So I can add my, for one maximized cost, I can add my Wisdom Modifier to a Cure spell. If I'm casting a Medium Heal, I can add my, ma my Wisdom Modifier times 2. If it's a Heavy, it's times 3, and if it's a Ultimate, it's times 4. Um, so, yeah. Uh, white Mages also gain a bonus to their Heal skill. Let's talk about some White spells, shall we? The White Basics are very uh, basic, as you might imagine. There's Cure, which is exactly what it sounds like. Bzz. Um, regen, which, uh, it has some d uh, detriments from Cure and some benefits. Technically, a regen will always heal more health than Cure over time. So if you need the health right now, it's not going to help. But regen also cannot do some of the things Cure does. For example, regen cannot uh, heal uh, major injuries, but Cure can. It can. It's a dice roll. Uh, regen cannot be cast on a downed individual, but Cure can in order to get them back up. And Regen cannot be multi-targeted, but Cure can. You, uh, there is also the spell Dia, which is extremely ex uh, normal. It's a d6 of light type damage. The white mediums are pretty simple. There is Life. The Life spell is uh, basically heals someone who is at downed. It can't be cast on someone who is not downed. But if someone is downed, they get up automatically. No rolls, no nothing. They just get up and they're healed for a bit. Uh, this cannot be multi-targeted. Asuna, which is a status ailment reducing spell. Now, this is a weird one. Because remember how there's spell levels? So you can cast Asuna 4, Asuna 5, Asuna 6. Well, the basically, the higher the level of the spell of Asuna the more, the more uh, difficult the ailments it can cure, and in some cases, the more ailments it can cure. For example, Doom is a pretty mean ailment, so getting rid of that would require more than a basic level 4 Asuna. But something really simple like just being poisoned, even mundane normal poison, that could be redu most reduced by a level 4 Asuna. Make sense? Then there's Null Element, which uh, reduces the amount of a specific type of damage that one person takes for a number of rounds. Uh, you cannot use this to get rid of typeless damage. Then there's the heavies. There are only two heavies. 
uh, Returned Life, which is effectively Life 3 if you've ever played Final Fantasy VI. In other words, it's a buff that you gain for a, for a decent number of period of time. Um, if at any point in time during that donation you were reduced to 0 HP, put into the downed condition, you immediately get right back up at half your maximum health. Um, for Now, what this means, for example, is let's say, to use an example, let's say there's an enemy here, you're here, you're moving up here, and you're like, duh, 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 and this guy gets an attack of opportunity down you. He hits you, puts you to downed, returned life goes off, immediately gets you up, and you can continue your action as if nothing happened. It's so instantaneous that your flow is basically uninterrupted, which is the benefit of that. Um, you can also maximize returned life to return them to full health rather than half. Um, you may wonder what's the point of spell levels for this. Uh, several effects, uh, especially buffs and debuffs, the spell level determines how long it lasts. So if you cast a basic level 8 returned life, it would only last for 8 rounds. So there's a benefit to increasing the duration there. Uh, renew. Now, Renew gets rid of everything except the downed condition and restores someone to full health. Uh, it also... Or wait, no. Yeah, yeah, and restores... Uh, it can. Uh, it gets rid of status ailments, gets rid of major injuries, blah, blah, blah. Um, it cannot be used on a downed person at all. It's effective even on non-living things, animals, and dead, etc., uh, it can be maximized to add a regen effect. Finally, the ultimates. Again, I want to stress ultimates are not automatically learned. Phoenix. Phoenix returns someone from the dead. Not downed. Dead. Actually returning someone from life. It is worth noting this is the only... As far as you're aware, this is the only way to return someone from the dead in the entire setting of Primus. Not the Imperium, just Primus. So, Phoenix is it. That's the only way to actually return someone from the dead. Period. You don't need a body to do it, by the way. Uh, that's it. That's, that's, again, we're just talking about the stat stuff, not the lore stuff, so that's all I've got for you there. And they can also uh, cast... The other ultimate is called Holy. Holy cannot be resisted. It penetrates just about everything. It can be multi-targeted up to three targets with no penalty and does a huge amount of, of light-type damage. So then we got Yellow Mages. Now, Yellow Mages are unique because they are full-on support class. They can do virtually nothing of themselves. They have a, a few things that put them slightly better than other mages in terms of, of stats, but for all intents and purposes, they are just a, uh, an, a, a support bot. Now, their innate ability is they have... Uh, hang on, I gotta, I gotta reread this because I think I've changed this since then. Ah, yeah, okay. Basically, a yellow mage gains uh, the ability to effectively undo time very briefly, once a day, period. What I mean by that is, uh, excuse me, it's once a day per three levels, so at max level, a yellow mage could redo this six times a day. Uh, yeah, that, I'm reading that right. Um, so what this means is you get a dice reroll in stat terms. It can be any dice reroll, yours or the enemy's. If you're doing it on an enemy or any unwilling target, they get the chance to have a willpower save against you rerolling their dice. Um, what, and when I say rerolling the dice, I mean any dice. Damage dice, d20 for skills, doesn't matter. Um, yellow mages, of course, get yellow magic. Uh, they also get a couple less meta magic feats than the others, which is understandable because they have less use for them. Yellow Magics, okay, so there's a lot of Yellow Magic spells, so I'm just going to go down the list here. Basic spells. Scan. I shouldn't have to explain what this is. Scan is actually a very morphic spell. It's much. There's much less, here's exactly what it does, and much more ask your GM when it comes to scan. The higher the level of scan, the more information, or the more likely it is to get information at all. Silence, which basically removes an ability, a person's ability to cast magic of any type. Uh, cannot be Most of these cannot be multi-targeted. I make a point right there. Cannot be multi-targeted. Cannot be multi-targeted. Um, of course, in virtually all of these cases, spell level determines duration. So silence. Uh, sleep. Now, sleep is interesting because it lasts very little time in combat due to the nature of combat. But if you manage to get a sleep off of someone out of combat, it lasts for much longer. Um, we're talking uh, hours instead of seconds. 
So, now sleep can be broken by a lot of things, including being attacked, uh, loud noises, sights, you know, etc. There's a lot of ways to break sleep. Uh, confuse. <laughs> Gotta be multi-targeted. Uh, confuse targets. I'm just going to read my own writing here. Confuse targets will behave randomly, often violently, attacking themselves, friends, and foes with whatever they have at their disposal. Uh, some types of enemies are immune to this effect. Uh can be this is a fun one all of these have a unique effect for maximizing some of it just increases the duration um but uh for example you can maximize scan to increase its spell level you can maximize confuse to deprioritize attacking or in hindering individuals who are friendly to the caster for example if i confuse you you might still attack me but if i maximize confuse you you're much less likely to attack me you're more likely to attack your allies over there berserk cannot be multi-targeted um, willpower check unless a willing target. That target forfeits their turns and control of their character to the GM for the duration. Will make the target do nothing but attack the nearest available enemy and nothing else on every turn. They gain a bonus to damage for doing so. May be maximized to increase the bonus to damage. Curse. Cannot be multi-targeted. Target must succeed a willpower check or be cursed. What the curse is, is up to the GM's discretion, but includes a lot of status effects. It's always just one status effect. Um, higher levels of curse pr can produce multiple effects, so I guess I lied about that, or worse effects. Can be maximized to increase the spell level by one. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, float. Float has seen a lot of use in the campaign. Uh, float is weird. You, you're floating, right? Now, floating is not flying, but here's the weird thing. Like, here's a, let's say here's a ledge, and there's a building over here you want to get to. It's at the same level. If you cast float, you will stay at this uh, altitude as you float your way over. So you can go like that. So it's a good way to do that, and it's been done several times. It can also be done to prevent falling damage if you're falling, for example. Um, can be maximized to increase duration. Uh, you can multi-target uh, based on spell level. Each spell level increases the amount of targets you can hit. Protect. Cannot be multi-targeted. Adds to DR. Can't be maximized to increase. Uh, shell. Cannot be multi-targeted. Adds to SR. Can be maximized to increase. Reflect. Cannot be multi-targeted. Reflect is unique. If I cast a level 5 Reflect on you, you have 5 points of Reflection on you. So if someone else casts a level 3 Fire on you, 3 of these points are lost to Reflect that spell back on them. If I cast a level 6 Fire on you, you get hit by level 6 Fire, because it breaks the Reflect. Make sense? So that's all the basic spells. Quite a few of them there, as you can tell. Yellow Medium Spells. Slow. Pretty much exactly what it sounds like. There's actually a lot of effects of slow. I'm not going to detail all of them. Um, lasts for so long. Can be maximized to increase the number of targets. Otherwise, you can only target on basically a small number of people. Haste. Also kind of what you'd expect. Can be maximized to increase the number of targets. Stop. Uh, target. Uh, when stopped, you are... I'm just going to read my own thing. You are incapable of moving, attacking, casting, or making any complex movements for the duration. You can still talk, see, hear, think, etc. Blink, you know, stuff like that. Um, each round, while stopped, there, the target may take a willpower check to try and break the stop. Um, can be maximized to increase the DC of trying to break it. Vanish. Vanish gives someone a advantaged stealth, which is exactly what it sounds like. Lasts for duration, blah blah blah. Dispel, kind of similar to Asuna, but can get rid of buffs in addition to debuffs, and can get rid of magical effects on items, can help remove uh, woven stuff, that kind of a thing. Uh, hasn't actually been used a lot in the campaign, which doesn't surprise me. Uh, Dispel, however, is different than Asuna, because Asuna can work on natural things. Like, for example, if you have malaria, Asuna can cure that. If you have Malaria, Dispel will do nothing to you, because Dispel only removes magical things. Makes sense? Uh, Imperil, one of my favorites, uh, may not multi-target. Target must succeed at a willpower save, or take additional damage from all physical sources of damage for the duration. Can be maximized to increase the difficulty. Uh, Enfeeble, may not multi-target. Target must succeed at a difficult willpower save, which can be increased by maximizing... Otherwise, they take increased damage from all magical sources of damage for the duration. Imperil and Feeble are pretty mean. Uh, then we've got the yellow heavy spells. Quick. Now, quick is a little bit weird. 
Uh, there's a lot of rules with how quick works. Basically, um, you get an, an, act, an additional action immediately following their ne your next turn. This could be you, so your next turn would be the turn you're doing right now, or someone else. Um, basically, you can only quick one person once a day. So, no matter how this works, if I want to quick, you know, Bob over there, I can do that. But even though I have more magic to cast, I cannot quick him again his next round. It, he ha it has to be... Now, there are three... Uh, just for a quick of rules verification here, there are three types of rests in this setting. Short rest, which is exactly what it sounds like, ten minutes of just... We'll get back a short rest. Long rest, which is basically your eight hours of sleep. It can actually be like six to eight, it doesn't matter. Or 24 hours, in which case an addition, an, a full cycle of the planet's existence has to move forward... Or before the effect comes back. That's what quick is. You need the full 24 hours before you can be quicked again. Um, let's see. Uh, I guess that's it. Um, Valor, which gains a bonus to someone's hit and physical damage. And Faith, which gains to someone bonus to uh, magical damage. Uh, exit. Now this is a funny one because Exit has been seen so many times in the campaign so far. Exit's a fun spell. Uh, you can cast Exit on a number of people equal to the spell level of Exit, okay? Now, if you Exit, the radius of Exit is huge. Like, I could be hundreds of feet from you, but if I consider you my friend, part of my party, and you consider me a friend and part of your party, so we both have to be mutual on this. It, it, you, can't, you can't break the spell. It knows. But if we're both allies, I can cast Exit, and it can grab you from a huge distance away. Uh, it, it's a few hundreds of feet. It's not infinite distance. Uh, exit immediately transports all of those people to safety. Now, Exit has been cast several times in the campaign. Each time what I do is I try to think in my head, what is safety? Now, the range on this teleport is not actually limited, really. So you can end up basically wherever. But it has to be safe, and it has to be safe for everyone being exited. These are the requirements. Usually, as the GM, I can come up with multiple places I consider to be safe for the people being exited. Whenever that happens, I uh, make it a point of, like, saying, okay, for example, this actually happened recently. There were six places that Hagaide and Sereth could end up when they cast exit. So I'm like, okay, well, let's figure this out. And I made a list of the six places, and I rolled a d6. That determined where they ended up. Make sense? Exit's a fun spell, and I rather like that one. Um... Oh. Excuse me, my throat's starting to give out. I've been talking for two days straight. The yellow ultimate spells uh, have not been seen very often, even though they are known. Uh, one of them is called Big Guard. Any fan of Final Fantasy probably knows what I'm talking about here. It basically gives you the benefits of Protect, Shell, and Haste for a, num for a duration. Um, basically, you can also maximize it to multicast it. Comet is the other one, which does a degree, which does a weird sort of damage. For anybody who's played uh, World of Warcraft, it does meteor damage. For anybody who hasn't, let's say you do the dice roll and it does thirty damage. That's actually pretty low, but let's just assume you're doing thirty damage with Comet. Um, and this damage hits one person. You know, the the Comet hits one person, so that one person takes thirty damage. Let's say it hits two people. Well, each person then takes 15 damage. Let's say it hits three people. Each person takes 10 damage. You see how this works out. The damage is spread equally amongst however many, um, however many people uh, it hits. Now, uh, there's kind of a dice roll involving how many targets it can hit. If you maximize Comet, it removes the dice roll. You can simply maximize how many targets it hits. So that's a fun thing. Uh, those are the basic mage classes. Uh, then we have green, uh, red mages. Excuse me, red mages is next. Um, red mages are exceptionally rare. They are basically a hybrid of your standard fighter and the white and black mages. Uh, they may gain the ability to learn uh, basic spells and medium spells. They don't actually have to pick from white and black. They can pick white, black, or yellow. It's up to their discretion, but they learn way fewer spells than the other classes do, and they will never learn an ultimate. In fact, a max level red mage will only know one heavy spell. Total. 
amongst all three disciplines, so that's up to their discretion. But they gain armor proficiency and much better hit dice, and the ability to actually function as a melee as well, which is the counteroff. The uh, Red Mage has also gained an innate ability, which is basically called Dual Cast. Dual Cast is effectively a number per day of free quickens. That's really what it is. Uh, if you remember me mentioning the quicken, uh, meta magic earlier, that's what they get. It's just they can do it a number of times per day rather than spending the meta magic for it. Then there's green mages. I literally have almost two pages just on green mages. There's so much to talk about there, but of course you just care about the stats. So, because you're a weirdo. Um, <laughs> green mages, uh, they, they're summoners, okay? But they don't summon Bahamut or Odin or Chocobo or whatever. They summon aspects. An aspect is an elemental version of yourself. Now, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. Most of it's lore, so we're going to ignore all that. The main point is each element produces a different type of aspect. I have all eight write-ups, and each aspect has its own leveling structure, and it specifically can gain new feats. It can only gain the feats that are specific to that aspect. It gains new skill-ups, new stat-ups... You know, all that stuff, it gains specific to that aspect. So each aspect will level differently than the others. An aspect's level is always equal to your level. Now, theoretically, a green mage could have one aspect, you know, the aspect of life, for example, or eight. There's no real limiter on that, right? There is one big caveat here. A green mage's aspect is going to be severely nerfed until they succeed at the trial of the given element uh, at the tel elemental temple of that element. For example, let's say you're a green mage who has a fire aspect. Now, most, as I've said many times, green mages are born with the ability to be a green mage. Most green mages discover their ability to be a green mage when they are still children. So, for example, a young child having a young, you know, fire elemental aspect of themselves, which is their companion as they're growing up. It, it, it becomes one of their best friends and integrally tied part of themselves, right? Very personal, very lore-based, which, of course, you don't care about. The relevance here, though, is that aspect, when, when the player character becomes level 1, that aspect is also level 1. However, if the player character goes all the way up to level 20, but never completes successfully the fire trial, that, ele that aspect is always going to be level 1. It will always be hampered by that. Now, the significance here is, most of the time, undertaking a trial, you don't really have to complete the trial successfully. You know, that's not the significance of undertaking the trials. There's other reasons for doing that. But for a stat perspective, you have to succeed at a trial to unlock the potential of your aspect. Hence, green mages make it a regular point to go to the various temples and try to succeed at the temples. They, they often take the trials multiple times, trying to understand what it is the trial is wanting of them in order to do, in order to succeed at it. Now, green mages can also do a couple of other things, really quick, stat-wise. Uh, one of those is a permanent binding. In other words, as I said before, a green mage can have one to eight aspects. There's no real limiter to that, unless they do a permanent binding. If they permanently bind someone, they lose all the other aspects. They're gone. And they gain this one aspect permanently. The difference now is this aspect is now out permanently. There's no more duration on how long they can summon them. That aspect is just out forever. Now, if it's da it goes into downed, it can't be resummoned for quite a while because of the result of that. And there's some detriments to this, and there's some benefits to this, but you get the general idea. Uh, a strong binding is a little bit different. A strong binding you can make with an aspect to basically gain an additional summon once per day without mana cost. Um, there is a detriment of that, and of course you can't actually do that for a while uh, afterwards. And if you lose that aspect while they're summoned under a strong binding, you lose the ability to summon that aspect for a month. So it's not something you want to do casually. Then there is the emergency summon. Now this is a weird one. Uh, I believe this is, yeah, once per week. Uh, you Well, it's not once per week. Basically, you can do an emergency summon to bring out an aspect right now. Just just right now. Just come out. Come out. Uh, there are some exceptions to when you cannot emergency summon. For example, I mentioned if a strong binding is lost for a month, you can't emergency summon it. If a permanent binding is lost and for the 24 hours, you can't emergency summon it. But under all those circumstances, you can bring out an emergency summon. Emergency summon is free. Uh, it just happens. It happens as a free uh, instant cast, so, you know, no time lost there. If you do it, you you cannot do it while another aspect is out, and uh, 
once that given aspect is... It, it, oh, oh, an emergency summon will also act, last twice as long as it normally would. However, an emergency summon, once summoned, cannot be summoned out for any reason for a week. So, you can do multiple emergency summons technically if you, if you tactically make it work. But otherwise, you are basically saying, I need you right now! Because you're going to be gone for a week after that. Now, uh, summons themselves. I'm not going to summons themselves. Basically, take the uh, the significance of the combat potential. I'm not going to go over all of them. Each one gains abilities that they can use to do certain types of damage, to buff weapons, to cause certain effects. There's a large list. I'm not going to go down the whole list. There's quite a few. Each uh, aspect also gains a uh, ability whose name I can't remember because I have no brain. Um, hang on, let me pull up the aspects list here. Here we go. Desperation. That's what I call it. A desperation move. Um, the Desperation moves are damned strong. They are once-per-week abilities, and that's, again, a week of time having passed before you can use a Desperation again. But each Desperation is really, really nice. Um, let me give you an example of what... Uh, really quick, this is the water aspect that I'm staring at right now. Uh, water aspects... This is badly This is badly formatted. Oh, I know why it's badly formatted, because I haven't installed OpenOffice yet on this computer. Um... A water aspect, basically each, uh, so many levels, they gain the ability to choose a new ability to learn. There's no tiering here. You can pick whichever one you want, you want to pick. Um, so, for example, when you start, you gain one ability, so you can pick any one of these to be the aspect's ability. At level 3, you get another one, etc. Uh, these include Freeze, which does an amount of water-type damage, which can multi-target with no damage penalty. Uh, Acid Storm, which can do a little bit of damage and lower the target's uh, DR. Essence Steel, which can heal the aspect for amount of damage. Uh, curative, which can heal someone and heal a major injury. Remedy, which removes all conditions, both positive and negative, from the aspect and the green mage. And Ice Saber, which basically is a, is a damage type buff to weapons. Um, now, a water, uh, if I'm not mistaken, where's the... It should say it like right around here. Maybe I'm in the... There we go. Uh, aspects have very specific equipment they can equip. You can equip them with custom stuff. If you do not equip an aspect, they basically come with a as with with the basic stuff, a completely basic weapon of their choice. But any given aspect can only equip weapons that they have the proficiency of. And I don't mean like all martial weapons. For example, a water aspect can only equip bows, not crossbows, not not, not lanyards, not not swords, nothing else. Just bows. That's the only thing they're proficient in. Uh, however. Scroll down a bit. They, uh, as they level, they gain uh, a selection of feats which they may choose. And I've selected these out, for example, point blank shot, rapid shot, far shot, precise shot, improved precise shot, able sniper, and improved initiative. All these things are things the water aspect can learn. Effectively, you're a, you are maintaining a second character sheet, or more, if you decide to have more. And that is the consequence of playing a summoner. But so far, the people who've played Green Mages uh, have really, really liked it, and so I'm hoping that that's something that's good, uh, despite the increased amount of paperwork it involves. Uh, I'll go ahead and tell you the Desperation move of Water, too, if I can find it better formatted, which I don't think I can. Is this one better? This is a little better. Okay, here we go. Uh, desperation. Dance, Water! Dance! What? Uh, summons 2d6 patterns of pillars of water that send enemies into the air for the next three turns. Summoners may choose where the pillars appear, but they must be connecting, i.e. there's no dots of pillars on the grid. Pillars will juggle enemies in the air, rendering them fully helpless uh, for the duration, if pillars reappear in the same spot to do so. Pillars do a lot of water-type damage. And there's other abilities like that. Um... Obviously, uh, they also each aspect has their own base attack bonus, uh, their own saving throws, their own feat progression, which is specific to their thing, etc., etc., etc. So that's green mages. Long, long discussion there. Let's let's move on. Blue mages. Now I'm not going to talk about these too much in in stat terms. Blue mages gain large bonuses to just about everything they do. Um, because of their nature, blue mages are designed to be overpowered. Blue mages gain a unique form of spellcasting, though. Basically, they have the innate ability to learn other spells. Now, the way learning works is if you cast a level 3 fire on me, I may learn level fire 3, or level 3 fire, right? I can't learn the fire spell and cast it up to my spell level like a black mage can. I learn the exact specific spell you have cast. You don't have to cast it on me. 
You just have to cast it in my proximity. I have to be aware of it. I could be watching a video of you casting Fire 3, and I can learn Fire 3 from that. Uh, Blue Mages do have a limit on how many spells they can learn, but it's pretty generous. Um, the, the, the point there is you just don't want to learn everything. You're supposed to be tactically sp picking which spells you want to learn. They also gain the innate ability to cast Reflection. Uh, this is a funny one. Uh, if you hit me with a spell, I immediately hit you with it too. Now, I still get hit with it. So uh, using the previous example, you hit me with Fire 3 Maximized. So it does 18 dam fire damage to me, right? Well, I automatically do 18 fire damage right back to you. If you don't maximize it and you hit me for like 12 fire damage, I hit you for 12 fire damage. It's a little reflection of exactly what I just got hit with. Uh, this can be, uh, there are some restrictions to this. You can't reflect something that happened, you know, a while ago. Like if you hit me with a spell and then five turns passed, I can't then decide to reflect it back on you. I have to basically do that as my next action. Reflection, however, is basically free. In other words, I can do that whenever I want to. Uh, or, or rather, I can do that infinitely. So if you're a mage and I'm a blue mage, I'm probably going to win this encounter because I can literally hit you with everything you're hitting me with and the end, basically. Uh, blue mages also gain um, gain HR and, S and SR naturally. Or excuse me, just SR. Blue mages gain SR naturally uh, and a couple of other things called blue slots. Uh, blue slots are a little bit different for example, I mentioned earlier I could learn Fire 3 from you. Well, if I do that, I can learn that for, and I have it right here, 3 minutes per caster level, okay? If I put, however, I have a certain number of blue slots where I can learn that spell permanently. So I can kind of pick and choose uh, how, how that works. So I, I actually spoke a little bit wrong earlier. Uh, blue mages are also proficient in weapons and armor as if they were red mages. So that's nice. Then there's the violet mage. I'm just going to read this. Rarer still than all previous types of mages listed, the Violet Mage is a walking nexus of power. Not a mage in the traditional sense of the word. A Violet is instead an individual who is born as a focal point for magical energy, a, with magic literally being a direct part of their breath and their bones. Violet Mages are really, really, really strong. Um, they gain limit breaks, which are basically exactly what they sound like. There's no limit on what a limit break can be, relatively speaking. It's just something you do that is damn strong. Gerlin was a violet mage. You remember that nuclear fire attack he'd do that would do 400 plus damage? That was a limit break. Uh, violets also gain the ability to attune to weapons, which basically, which, you know, it takes some time and effort, but once you do that, that weapon is not only yours, hence more, no one else can wield it, but it's much better and much stronger. Violet mages gain a huge bonus to their health, their SR and their DR, and they uh, pretty much can auto hit. They have a huge bonus to their attack. And there's a few dozen other things that violet mages get, which I'm not going to share. Basically, violet mages are ridiculously overpowered. Now let's talk about a couple of the hybrids that I talked about re briefly here. Paladins, druids, and rangers still have some spellcasting ability. Bards do not. Uh, bards, I change in a different way. Bards basically have the ability to have more skill points. That's really what bulls do. They, they really have become skill bots. Uh, paladins gain a very small number of white spells. However, they have a decent amount of, of mana progression. Uh, druids may choose two of the three spells at character creation. They may never change this, ever. But they can choose yellow and black, black and yellow, or yellow and black, yellow and white, black and white, or black and yellow. They can choose any two of the uh, uh, combination of the three. And from that point on, those are the things they can learn spells from as they level. They gain a very small number of spells and have a decent mana progression. Rangers may only cast white magic. They gain a stupidly small amount of spells and have actually pretty decent mana progression. So that's the normal classes. God, we've been talking for a while here. I hope you're happy, person who asked this. Uh, what are we at? Oh, God. I actually run out of... Oh, God, my background has screwed up. Ah! Okay, there. We'll, we'll skip forward in the background. Oh, no, that was actually rain, wasn't that? It was just really dark rain. Wow, that's just impressive. Um, anyways, <laughs> getting back into this here. Hang on, we need to actually adjust this up because of how bright it is today. There we go. Uh, let's talk about some of the prestige classes. I'm just going to blaze through these because we've already been talking for so, so, so long. Oh my god, you guys. Um, Geomancers. Geomancers are born with... Uh, you have to be born a Geomancer. You cannot be trained it. Um, the Geomancers are those rare individuals born with an innate connection to the elements. 
Uh, Geomancers have requirements that basically require them to cast uh, certain levels of medium or uh, medium magic, which re basically requires you to be level 4 in certain classes or level 8 in certain classes, or have at least 4 levels in Green Mage or Blue Mage. You also have to have undertaken one of the trials and actually succeeded at it. Um, now, a Geomancer can continue to gain uh, new spells and mana, but does not gain other benefits of the or their origin class. They gain the ability to cast Gaia. I have a whole chart for this. Uh, Gaia... You, you have so many uses of Gaia per day, basically. And Gaia creates an effect based on the terrain you're in. Uh, you may have seen Snarg ask me, you know, what, what's the terrain type I'm considered in? Because he's a Geomancer now. And I say, well, you're in a desert, or you're in a mountain, or you're in a city. And so that affects what, what he can cast with Gaia. Now, he and I ha haggled this out a bit, and I decided the way it works is you may choose which Gaia effect it is, but you... If you you can't choose the same one twice in a row, basically. You can't just spam the same Gaia effect. That's the that's the point there. It used to be random, but he didn't like the idea of random, so I'm with him on that. Um, I tell you the terrain type, obviously. There, there's a list of certain things uh, that, that you can do that. Uh, uh, Geomancers also gain the ability called Sense Deterrence, which gives them the ability to uh, sense traps, hidden pits, unusual facets, oddities, magical things, blah, blah, blah. Uh, does not function as well in an urban environment. And Light Step, which they gain later on, which means they are immune to traps, pits, etc. They can also do things like walk on water, lava, clouds, acid pits, and so forth uh, while they are doing Light, sped, light Step. Uh, a Geomancer later on gains the ability to have certain maximized Gaias, which is exactly what it sounds like. Removes all dice roll. Just does the maximum effect. So that's a Geomancer. Um, let's move on to... Well, I guess, you know, really quick, I'll give you... Uh, for those of you who haven't actually been watching the, li the live campaign where Snark has been reading several of his Geomancer abilities, I'll read a couple for you. So let's say you're in uh, Desert. You can do Sandstorm, which does Earth or Air damage, uh, depending on your choice, to any number of targets, no multi-targeting penalty. Uh, if you're in a Cavern, you may cast Poisonous Mushroom, which makes someone do a Fortitude save uh, every round for 1d6 rounds, or be debilitated with diseases and poisons, which will do uh, a number of damage every round for a number of rounds. If you are in an aquatic, uh, it might do Whirlpool, which immobilizes, roots someone for a number of mounts. Uh, they must do a swim check, which is athletics, in order uh, of a certain DC, or else if they fail the swim check every round, they take water damage that given round. And so forth and so on. There's quite a lot of here. Uh, there's also a terrain type called Warped. Party hasn't actually encountered this yet. Well, I mean, not really. Uh, warped stuff does really, 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 really mean things. Um, hang on. I gotta find uh, the really fun one. I'll just read all four to you. One of them is called Alien Energy. It does a, no a large amount of typeless damage to a target. Any individual who is aware of that effect being cast, which includes the Geomancer who casts it, must succeed at a will save or be confused, put in the confused status, for two rounds. A wash, which does 1d4 random status elements to anything within uh, a certain square of area. There is no save to prevent it, and it hit friends and foes alike. Unchain. Target must succeed at three saves of a certain DC of will, you know, will in this order, willpower, fortitude, and reflex. Any failure of this will result in them taking an amount of typeless damage and being forced to start the chain again. If you all three succeed uh, in a roll, nothing happens. If all three fail, well, that, that, that's obvious. Um, oh, oh, so I see how this, okay, so like, for example, okay, I'm gonna do my willpower's roll, and I fail it, so I take damage. So now I have to do the willpower roll again. Now I succeed at it, so I do the fortitude roll, but I fail that, so I take damage and I go back to the willpower roll. Now, if through the course of this, I have failed all three rolls, for example, and it doesn't matter when this happens, if I fail willpower, succeed and fail fortitude, succeed, succeed and fail reflex, I permanently lose my connection to the elemental ley lines. In other words, I become a desolate. Uh, the other one is called Thorns of Madness. Target is suddenly grasped by thorns of solid obsidian, rooting them in place and doing a number of damage per round until the thorns are broken. Thorns can be broken by uh, an amount of damage being done to them or a significantly powerful strength check. Each round they are, da they are rooted, they must succeed at a willpower save or lose their round due to the trauma of being trapped in those thorns. 
But anyway, when I say they're wrapped in thorns, I don't mean just their feet. Their whole body is. Yeah. So that's Geomancers. Uh, let's talk about Oracles. I like Oracles. Uh, the oracles are the random class. I, I mean this quite literally. Oracle has the ability called... Uh, two abilities. One called Condemn and one called Predict. Um, you... Uh, you have infinite casts of these. You can cast Condemn every round for, for forever. There's no limit on that. Uh, what Condemn does is has a random effect with a random effect, if you follow me. Uh, it's like this. I'll just go... I'll, I'll describe by just giving you the chart. Condemn, you roll a d8. I don't have my dice handy, but let's just say I rolled a 5. So that means the effect is the spell Judgment. Now... One other niggle. When I roll that d8, now I, I thought I had my d20 right here, but I don't. When I, when I cast Condemn or Predict, I have to roll a d20. That d20, if it's a 1 or a 20, affects the result. If it's anything else, it doesn't matter. So, in other words, if you're paying attention, this is the random class. I can't decide what I'm doing. So I got a 5, so that's Judgment. So that does an amount of air damage to a target. Okay. Now let's say I roll that 20 and I got a 20. Well, that uh, also makes the target be silenced for three rounds. Well, let's say I got a one. Well, instead of doing the damage to the target, it does the damage to a random friendly. Yeah, if I am doing, if I did the D8 of Condemn and I rolled a one, it does an amount of healing. If I roll a critical failure on that, it heals my enemy. So you can see how uh, oracles would be fun, if probably a little bit uh, frustrating. Uh, they actually gain improved critical, too, which is both good and bad. In other words, in, instead of running a 1 or a 20, I could roll a 1 to a 4 or a 16 to a 20. So greater chance of critical success and greater chance of critical failure. There's no optional here. You have to do this. It's, it's, it's a mandatory, mandatory part of the class. Yeah. Um, so that's Condemn. Now, Condemn is always a single target. Condemn always applies to a single target. Cannot hit multiple. Predict always affects all targets. So a predict will be cast on all allies or all enemies. Uh, to give, and now predict, there are 10 effects. You roll a d20 to determine. Uh, let's say we roll uh, a 9, which, which casts Healing Wind. Uh, that does healing to all friendlies and removes all negative status effects. If I roll critical failure, we're still healed. It just also does the same thing to all our enemies. So they're all healed for the amount and all their status effects are removed. If, however, I critical succeed, it doubles the healing flat to us. That's Oracle in a nutshell. Uh, Guido is thinking about picking up Oracle soon, which I'm super hyped for. I actually, Oracle was one of the funnest classes for me to design, and I'm really sad that no one's picked it up so far. Mystic Knight! Okay, Mystic Knight is a weird thing. The requirements are pretty weird. Basically, you have to be some kind of hybrid. Uh, you have to have the ability to both cast and be martial, and oh my god, the sun! The sun is my enemy today. <laughs> I swear to God. Um, if you are a Mystic Knight, um, you can gain new spells, kind of, but you cannot gain new mana. Mystic Knights uh, are kind of an upgrade of, of Red Mages. They gain three abilities uh, unique to them. Uh, we'll talk about the big one last. They gain Magic Barrier. Uh, basically, this is a permanent SR bonus to them. So based on their level, they gain, a, they gain an amount of SR, just period. Uh, spell resistance. I've been mentioning it a few times. Spell resistance and and damage resistance. It's very obvious. Physical damage, magical damage, right? Um, runic blade is something they can get later on. Uh, basically, you I roll a dice roll to see if you succeed. But if you succeed, you can absorb a spell into your weapon, um, and that and that means the spell doesn't happen. So if someone's casting you know fire three at you, I can say you know I want to runic that as a reaction, so I can do this off-round. I can do this not as part of my round. And I try to runic fire three into my blade. I now have fire three in my blade. Um, there's two things you can do about that. You can absorb it into yourself, uh, which basically makes the spell go away, or you can use it as your spell blade, which brings me to my next point. Uh, Mystic Knight can cast any spell that they actually know, that they have learned as part of their mage training, into their weapon, their, their friends' weapons, or their enemy weapons. It is worth noting natural weapons apply. For example, I could cast this into your claws or into your teeth. Okay. Um, this spell blade will last for a certain number of rounds. Uh, any successful attack made with that weapon, it has to actually hit and do damage, will then make the spell actually be cast. 
equivalently, right? This can be uh, this can be healing spells. This can be damaging spells. It can be whatever, basically. Um, let's see. I'm, I'm reading the rules here really quick. You know, a bunch of errata to show exactly how this works. Blah 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 blah. Um, in spell level of this will always be less than normal uh, due to the nature of it. But like I said, Runic Blade can be used to kind of get a free spell blade as a result of that. And also lasts a decent amount of time. Uh, you gain a number of spell, days per, spell blades per level. In other words, you, you don't actually cast mana to, put, to use a spell blade. You have uses per day. Uh, so, you, so you still have all your natural magic that you have from otherwise. And then there's this class. This is the simplest class, and yet it's the one that has generated the most interest amongst the players and has been seen most in the campaign. The Dragoon. The requirements for a Dragoon are pretty severe. Um, you have to have undertaken the uh, t t uh, Temple of Heirs trial. You have to be specialized in spear, focused in spear. <laughs> um, you gain no mana, no nothing. Now, when you are wielding a spear uh, as a Dragoon, the spear does more damage. Uh, the specific patterning is basically, instead of doing a d8, you do 2d6, to, to name the most simple, basic uh, concept of this. Um, as you level as a Dragoon, you gain a bonus to, that's called Dragon Focus. Uh, basically, each increase to Dragon Focus increases the, the, your bonus to hit and your bonus to damage. Now, as an aside, all Dragoon abilities require a spear. Uh, different kinds of spears are valid, but it still has to be a spear. Um, so, for example, at uh, level 2 Dragoon, you have a plus 2 to hit and a plus 2 to damage with that spear. That also applies to jumps, by the way. And yeah, you know this was coming. So jump, it's pretty much exactly what you'd think. You zoom, zoom up and you go, bam, and you blast down onto them. Uh, jump is basically an attack roll, but it has a pretty big bonus to hit. And the damage is further increased by your level. And of course, the dragon focus increases it again. Jump can be used infinitely. There is no limits on uses per day. The higher level you are, the further you can jump, uh, capping up at 60 feet of a jump range, which is pretty huge. Uh, extended jump is something you get higher level, which you, uh, even at a high level Dragoon, only gets one extended jump per day. Extended jump, you go up into the air and you basically hover there in the air for a number of turns, up to your choice, your choice up to three turns. Uh, when you slam down, you pierce DR, you automatically hit, and you do bonus damage based on how long you were in the air. Uh, then there's unerring jump. This is funny. Unerring jump cannot, makes it so that all your jumps cannot miss ever again. Your jump will always hit. Doesn't matter the target's AC. Unerring jump means it's a ba it's a passive ability. It basically, means your jumps will literally always hit, even if the target is intangible, or concealed, or protected. You can hit someone through a wall with unerring jump. Yeah, uh, that's Dragoons. Uh, now I actually have more prestige classes. Yeah, I know, we're not even done yet. God, what else do you want to know? Classes and races. Yeah, so okay, we're going to stop after we're done talking about the other prestige classes. i got to go to my Google, Google Drive for these ones. Oh, wrong, 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 wrong one. Hang on. Here we go, my documents. Uh, prestige, prestige. It should be like right friggin' here. Where is it? Oh, it's under references. Here we go, bamf. Okay, so I came up with a couple new prestige classes, most of which have been seen, some of which have been taken by the party. Orator. Okay. Orators are pretty rare folks who uh, have a requirement of seven ranks each in diplomacy, deception, and two separate knowledges. An orator uh, gains one bonus from their base class. Uh, for example, a rogue, they continue to gain sneak attack progression. A barg, they continue to gain barnic sog progression. And a mage, they gain their mana progression. Okay. Um, they gain speech abilities, which I'll talk about in just a moment, and they gain the ability, uh, once they're at fifth level uh, of an orator, they gain the ability called Silver Tongue. Now here's the weird thing about orators. When you are leveling an orator, you get 14 plus int skill, uh, skills per level, okay? All skills, except for weaving, are a class skill for orators. Now here's the significance. You can only get an orator to level 5. But once you hit level 5, you gain that Silver Tongue ability, which means forevermore, no matter what class you are leveling, all class skills, all, all skills are now class skills forever, regardless of what you're leveling, other than Weaving. Weaving's the exception. Um, speech abilities. Okay, so you can use speech abilities a number of times per day equal to your current Charisma modifier. So if you have a Charisma mod of 3, you can use them 3 times per day. 
Um, there are ways to raise this. If you have a temporary buff to your charisma or a magical item boosting your charisma, that will raise that. Uh, speech abilities require the target to be able to understand you. So if you can't speak or they can't hear or you don't speak the same language, it doesn't work. Uh, it is possible to resist an ability. Th those are usually mentioned in the things. Each ability uh, I'm going to list here. Uh, there are five speech abilities. Wait, hang on. One, two, three, four, five, six. I was going to say, there's more than five. There's seven speech abilities. Over the course of leveling your oratory, you get five. You can pick. So you have to pick five of those seven. These include persuade. Enforce a charisma contest to convince an enemy of reasonable disposition to switch sides in or out of combat. Stall. Convince a given target to delay their next action. Praise. By the way, praise and threaten do not work simultaneously. Praise gives an individual a morale boost to all rolls, except for damage, for a number of minutes. Threaten. Gives a target a negative morale boost to all rolls, except damage, for a number of minutes. Demoralize. Attempt to convince a target of the futility of their given actions, causing them to abandon it. Usable in and out of combat. Beg. Usable out of combat to strongly, strongly convince someone towards a given action. This will usually result in lowering their disposition towards you, so it's, it's a kind of a temporary gain for a long-term loss. However, it has a very high rate of success. And finally, insult. I like this. Infuriates a target in or out of combat with unpredictable results. Um, both party members who have taken a level in Orator, which is Zeriel and Zeiss, have taken the Persuade ability, which does not surprise me. Fell Knights. Now, Fell Knights are interesting. Uh, again, I don't want to get too much into the lore, but Fell Knights channel desolate energy. That's all I'm going to say about that. Nobody knows that, by the way. Uh, that's a total spoiler thing. But that's how, how they work. So they're not full-on desolates. They're not full-on desolation. But they are wielding desolate energy, so they tend to be rather disliked by other people for the same reason desolates are. Most people don't realize why they like dislike Fell Knights. And over the time, basically, there's a cultural stigma against Fell Knights that has arisen because everyone dislikes Fell Knights, so there has to be some reason for it, right? So it's become to the point where the, the negative stigma is against Fell Knights themselves. The party's owner only encountered one of these. Uh, oh, I should know his name, because he's actually kind of relevant and he's going to be coming back into the party pretty soon. But anyways, he's an Amorsman. Fell Knights uh, have a pretty steep requirement to be. Uh, they have to wield a two-handed weapon, which they, they basically convert into a fell arm. Um, they can switch fell arms. It takes time and effort and attunement, and they have to commune with the weapon. But basically the point is they have this one weapon, and it is their weapon. Um, they do not gain anything from previous classes. Uh, they gain, uh, they can choose an armament, which they may use. They may use an armament a number of day, times per day equal to the fell knight's level. The Fell Knight has to be using their Fell Arm in order to use, to, uh, use an armament. Um, all armaments functionally in stats are uh, melee strikes. However, the range of armaments increases over time. But what I mean by this, this is, this is actually, I'm sorry, that's a separate thing, that's a separate thing. Um, basically, a level 1 Fell Knight can, who, who normally can attack someone who's 5 feet away, can attack someone who's 10 feet away as if they were in melee range. For all intents and purposes, they are doing a melee strike. It's just at someone who's at range. That range increases over time until it's a bonus of 25 feet. So, in other words, 30 feet away, they can strike someone at melee. Um, armaments function in the same way, although they have their own rules about that. Uh, they also gain the ability called vehemence, or vehemence if you prefer. Um, they can take from their own health pool in order to drain it into their attack to do damage at a 3 to 1 conversion rate. In other words, three health for one additional damage. Uh, they cannot go below one health with vehemence. They cannot kill themselves or put themselves into down to doing so. It's not allowed. Um, you have to decide you're doing that before you swing. So, for example, I want to put nine health into three more damage of this thing. And if you miss, you're still down nine health. But no bonus damage is done because you missed the hit because it's still a melee swing, okay? Now, armaments. You get to choose armaments. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. And again, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, again, you get to pick five of the seven if you level it all the way. These include... Um, sing... Wait, hang on. Let me check something. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, you can do an armament a number of times a day equal to your Fel Knight level specifically. Our uh, Sanguine Armament. You perform a swing. If it hits, you do double damage. Does not double critical damage. Uh, it drains half of that damage rounded down to heal the Fel Knight. Dusk Armament. 
Standard swing in a three-sided uh, three square centered on a valid target. The damage of the swing does one-third damage uh, and drains one-fourth of the total damage done to you. What I mean by this is it's basically a cleave. If there's three squares here which have enemies in them, you hit all three enemies for a reduced damage and drain all three enemies for reduced damage to heal you. Infernal Armament. Um, this is a fun one. Standard melee swing. If it hits, you do no damage. However, all the damage you would have been done, like you, you roll for damage, their health doesn't move, but all that damage is done to their mana instead. Abyssal Armament. For this strike, you may change your uh, vehemence from a ratio of 3 to 1 to 1 to 1, but only for the armament, only for doing specifically an abyssal strike. Sacrificial armament. Again, three-sided square. Uh, when I say square, by the way, you, you can do it like, like in a line, you can do it like in the Tetris block or like this. It doesn't matter as long as all three squares are connected. Um, Perform this free strike. Uh, for this strike, you may drain your health at a ratio of two health to one damage. So it's basically an AOE version of the Abyssal Strike I just mentioned. Shell Burst Armament. This is a fun one. Perform a standard melee swing on any target who is wearing armor. All damage done is instead done directly to that person's armor rather than them. Armor that is destroyed disintegrates, immediately robbing the target of any and all benefits thereof. And of course, the Hellcry armament, which is the exact same thing, but it hits their weapons instead of their armor. Fell Knights are mean. Armadamnul, or armas, as some people call them. This is a weird one. It's hard to explain why an Armadamnul is fascinating. They, the party's actually fought one of these, the Burun, uh, in, the, in the Danby's arena that Guido fought. An Armadamnul, um, it requires uh, skill focus weaving. Ranks in weaving, minimum base attack bonus, and weapon focus in at least one martial, aka melee weapon. Um, they have some weird abilities. Basically, they have the ability called Draw Soul, which they gain a number of uses per day. What they do is they, like, let's say I have a dagger here. I, I do this, and I draw upon the soul of this weapon to create a magical effect, which just happens just like that. Uh, it's a, it can be done as a, uh, a standard action, of course. Um, whatever the weapon is has to be in some way magical, even if the weapon was woven, if it's a magical weapon, you know, there has to be something for that. Uh, an Armadamnul will always be able to tell the difference. You know, you can't trick an Armadamnul into giving them a mundane weapon. They'll know. Uh, Armadamnuls also gain a huge bonus to their appraise, as an aside. Um, the, uh, so they can use this a number of times per day, uh, uh, per their level. Uh, the effects are always beneficial. And they tend to be pretty strong, but uh, I guess that's it. Uh, they also gain the ability called affix weapons. Now this is a weird one. They can affix their weapons to themselves and then draw them at free as as a free will action, uh, at will action. So um, the Baroon I mentioned, he came out. He had like swords and axes and spears just attached all over him, and it kind of creates them a weird look because they don't exactly look professional. But literally, you could literally just affix a sword to your head, and it'll just sit here, unmoving until you remove it. Anyone else trying to remove it has to try and physically rip it off you, and it's very difficult to do. Um, like I said, you can be drawn as a free will without penalty or difficulty. This means you can, for example, attack with this sword that's on my head, and if I get two attacks per round, which I do, I can immediately put it back, draw another one, and attack you with this other sword. I can choose which weapons I hit you with at will. Um, the, uh, now, to affix a weapon does require an attunement period. You can't pick up a sword off the ground and go... You have to, affix, you have to attune it to yourself, but once you've done that... Uh, the final point is uh, they have this thing called perfect focus. Armadamnuls can do wield with no penalties. None. Yeah. <laughs> um, there is one trick to this. Uh, an Armadamnul is proficient in every weapon, including natural weapons, except maglancers, which are a completely different thing. Uh, we'll talk about Maglancers in a bit. <laughs> Gladiators. This is admittedly probably my least interesting uh, class. This, this is a class I put together because it was kind of requested to have a heavy hitter. Uh, the party's actually fought one of these, too. He nearly one-shot. Uh, Snarg, I believe. Uh, you have to have certain feats, including whirl, whirl, Whirlwind Attack and Cleave. A Gladiator gains... Uh, a Basically, they gain the ability to do a crap ton of damage. They gain these abilities... Uh, that they can use more or less at will. 
and they gain more of these as they increase their level. Um, Blade Burner, okay? The way this works is they make a charging attack in a direction. Anything in the way of that direction... Uh, okay, like if I do this against a wall, I'll just <laughs> smash into the wall and it won't be good. However, if I do this like this along the wall, everyone to the left and right of me as I'm zooming through, basically everything in reach, whatever my reach is, as I'm zooming through you, will be attacked while I'm going through you. Uh, you, I do a single roll for dam for if I hit, and a single roll for damage, and it just applies to everyone equally. Uh, Gladiators also gained improved and greatly improved critical automatically uh, as they level. Uh, they also gained an ability called Blitz, Blade Blitz. That was Blade Burner, that was the early one. Uh, Blade Blitz gives them the innate passive ability for all their swings to be turned into cleaves. Uh, not great cleaves, just normal cleaves. Basically, if I hit you, I can automatically hit anyone else around you. Again, one roll. So if I hit, so if I've got a guy who's got 14 AC and a guy who's got 20 AC, I can aim for the 14 AC guy and hit him, and it will do damage to the 20 AC guy, right? Finally, Blade Crush. This is just plain uh, the ability to do hit a single target for four times damage if I hit. That's it, just... <laughs> I have to be a high-level gladiator to do that. Uh, that's the attack that nearly leveled Snarg, I might add. And finally, Freelancers. Freelancers use Maglancers. Um, a Freelancer... Uh, okay, a Freelancer has to have weapon proficiency Maglancer, which is a completely separate uh, proficiency. I don't want to get too much into the lore for that, but you have to basically specifically be proficient in Maglancers in order to be a Freelancer, and it's not easy to become proficient in Maglancer. You can't just pick that as a feat as you level. You have, there's lore backing behind that, which I'm not going to bore you with. Um, freelancers gain nothing from previous classes. Uh, they start off with the ability called Free Focus. Free Focus gives them a bonus to their hit, to, to hitting a target, equal to twice their level, their, ma their, their total level, not their Freelancer level. It also gives them the ability to dual-wield Maglancers. And I have a note here. This is the only way to dual-wield Maglancers. How's our backup? Okay, we're still visible. Um... A freelancer also gains lancets. This is similar to all the other things. You, you get so many of them, you have to pick and choose, right? Same thing. Uh, lancets require having a maglancer equipped to function, kind of how dragoons do. Um, so, track shot. Uh, I, choose, I shoot a target at a bonus to hit equal to the number of freelancer levels I have. And, uh, or yeah, so basically I gain an additional bonus to hit in addition to free focus. Uh, so basically doubling my free focus bonus to hit, and I completely ignore all forms of cover or concealment. I, I'm going to hit you. Uh, charge shot. Sh I shoot a lance which, will uh, which upon hitting a target will keep going through them in the direction I aimed to hit additional targets up to the range limit, which is pretty high. Uh, ricochet shot. This is fun. This attack will not only treat the given target as flanked for all that that matters, this is also true for the rest of the party, but will maintain that target as flanked for the next two rounds after they've been hit by Ricochet. Trick Shot. This does uh, less damage than normal, basically 11 minus the Freelancer's level of damage. However, it cannot be reduced below 1. However, Trick Shot hits. Period. There is no way for it to miss under any circumstances. Uh, combine Shot requires two mag lancers. You shoot with both simultaneously, uh, make two attack rolls, make two damage rolls, accept the highest of both. In other words, you're basically... <laughs> this is funny, I wrote this before 5th edition came out, so now I could just say uh, ra uh, combined shot gives you advantage on both the attack and damage. Easier way to say that. Rapid shot. This is a fun one. This is a two-round action. Takes up two full rounds to do. You smatter a cone area up to, to up to range with lots of weaker shots requiring only one damage and one hit roll. It hits everything in the cone for both rounds. People can move out of this cone, obviously. Uh, these lines do not go through targets unless they otherwise would. For the yeah, oh, oh, for the second round of the spray, you may turn up to 90 degrees in either direction in order to re-aim where your cone is. So if someone tried to move, you can be like, Ehh! and basically just picture them constantly shooting out this spray of death in your direction. Sniper shot. Attack, this attack's range is increased to line of sight with no penalties to hit. 
Any, tar any target that is unawares is considered flanked for this attack and gives sneak attack damage. And any further attacks, uh, and, and to any further attacks in which they are still unaware of the freelancer's location. Hence why it's called sniper shot. For example, if I have some kind of either magical or mundane device to see you from a mile away, I can just hit you. And each time it's going to be doing sneak attack damage, and each time it's, it's not going to have any penalty to hit, uh, as long as you're unaware of my existence. Finally, freelancers can get the ability called Blink. Freelancers may use up their move action to instead teleport to any visible location within a range that's variable based on your level. This is in all directions as long as they know where they're blinking to and nothing's obstructing them. I can go up, down, left, right, in any direction. I could perch myself up on a, on a building. I could go inside a building as long as there's a way to get in there, like a window or whatever. Doesn't matter. Uh, okay. I hope you're happy, person who asked this question. Oh, man! This is like my longest one ever. This is classes and stuff. If you have any further questions, as ever, feel free to ask qualifying co uh, questions in your comments below. <sighs> Otherwise, I'll see you next time, guys.